Heavenly Father, we come before you this morning. We come before you with thankful hearts for this day that you have allowed us once again to gather together as a, as a congregation. Lord, we realize that uh, others will be coming at different times of the day. But Lord, you've blessed us. You've kept us strong. You've kept us healthy. And Lord, for that we give you thanks. Thank you, Lord, for the, in spite of the cold weather, Lord, that we have warm homes, we have warm vehicles, we can travel in safety. And Lord, for all these blessings, Lord, we just give you thanks. We thank you above all, Lord, for eternal life that you've given us through your son who uh, died on the cross, rose again, and that we, by trusting in him, by the finished work of the cross, can have eternal life. So again, Lord, on this uh, morning, as we gather together for the first time in many months, we thank you and ask your blessing upon all that takes place. Lord, bless uh, the uh, word as it uh, applies to us, and Lord, may we apply it to our hearts. And Lord, may we go from here, from this place, uh, having been blessed by knowing that we have been together in the house of the Lord. So we give you thanks for all these blessings in Christ's name. Amen. Well, we're glad to see you out here this morning. We're glad to see smiling faces in our building again. And we're not preaching on Saturday morning. We're preaching on Sunday morning. And that's a wonderful thing. So we are very, very thankful. Uh, to those of you who aren't here yet, uh, we want to know that we're still thinking of you. And we're looking forward to getting to see you once again when we're able to. Uh, just a few announcements and things we wanted to go over really quick. Uh, as we start out back at church again, uh, the guidelines are the same as they were last time. So if you remember back, that means you have to wear your mask into the building or when you're moving around in the building. But when you're sitting, you can take it off, no problem. Uh, that's just fine. Uh, other things, if you head down to the washrooms, they are there, they're open. There are some wipes in there, just wipe down any surfaces you touched uh, once you're done in the washroom. Uh, other things, uh, you're all doing it already, but leave at least four chairs between yourself and the next person from a different family unit than you uh, so that we have that six feet between everybody. Uh, these are all the things. There's hand sanitizer available at all the doorways if you want to use that, all that kind of stuff. Our offering box is on your way in. And then you'll notice in the foyer as you walked in this morning, there's a table there with our books that we've been advertising. And I forgot to grab some and bring them up, so you'll have to look at them on your way out. But we have the Red Sea Rules, which we talked about a while ago. Many of you ordered. There's still a few copies available if you want one. Uh, a good book there. Uh, there's The Pursuit of God by A.W. Tozer. Uh, also a great small read, but a very challenging one uh, if you choose to pick that one up. Both of those are $10.00. And then there's Where is God in a Coronavirus World, which is just a 62-page little thing. Uh, and it's only $5, but it's also very worth the read. So if you want to pick any of those up, let us know, and we can take your money and give you a book and uh, let you walk home with something new to read this week. That would be a good thing. Uh, we do want to advertise that we have a need with our sound and our PowerPoint in the back there. Neither of them are incredibly taxing or strenuous jobs, but we do need some volunteers to help out with those. Uh, right now, two of our deacons are there, but those guys both work shift work type jobs, and so they aren't able to always be there filling in for this service. And then we have uh, a couple people maybe in the second and the third service who could do it, but we could always use more substitutes. So if you feel like you're able to click a button over and over and over, or if you feel like you're able to slide something up and down once or twice in a service, then we can use you. And uh, we'd love to have you volunteer in one of those roles and help us out in that way. Uh, we will train you. We won't just throw it at you and say, go do it. We'll make sure you have what you need in your brain to be able to pull it off. But we could use a few extra volunteers for those things. Uh, we wanted just to make sure that you also know um, the church office is open Tuesday to Friday from 9 till 4. Those are like our official hours. Uh, there are occasionally people in on other times, but those are the hours when if you need to leave a message to the church, if you need to give us a call, if you need to send an email, those, those are the times that we definitely will answer. Uh, but if you wait till Saturday maybe to send in something and try and sneak into a service on Saturday, we might not get it. We might, we might not. Yesterday I think Pastor Dan was in answering the phones, and so he heard some of those ones. Um, 
But make sure that if you want to for sure get your message into the office, uh, we're open Tuesday to Friday. You can stop by, you can give us a call, you can give us an email, and we will make sure that we get back to you. Our scripture reading this morning comes from 1 Peter chapter 2. I'm going to read 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 1 to 12, so why don't you turn with me there, and uh, why don't you stand with me as well as we read God's holy word. 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 1 to 12. So put away all malice and all deceit and hypocrisy and envy and all slander. Like newborn infants, long for the pure spiritual milk that by it you may grow up into salvation, if indeed you have tasted that the Lord is good. As you come to him, a living stone, rejected by men but in the sight of God, chosen and precious, you yourselves, like living stones, are being built up as a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. For it stands in Scripture, Behold, I am laying in Zion a stone, a cornerstone, chosen and precious, and whoever believes in him will not be put to shame. So the honor is for you who believe, but for those who do not believe, the stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone, and a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense. They stumble because they disobey the word, as they were destined to do. But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Beloved, I urge you, as sojourners and exiles, to abstain from the passions of the flesh which wage war against your soul. Keep your conduct among the Gentiles honorable, so that when they speak against you as evildoers, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day of visitation. May God add his blessing to the reading of his words. You may be seated. People in general like to fit in wherever they are. Whether the event or activity would be considered great or small, important or uh, minimal in terms of its importance, but consider an event such as an informal party or even a formal gathering, such as a graduation, a funeral, or even a posh government fundraising uh, function. <clears throat> no one wants to come dressed formally to a casual occasion or come casually dressed to an event that's designated as a black tie uh, event. Even if we were to dress appropriately, there are times when you and I are still ill at ease. Sports enthusiasts might hesitate attending a session for a poetry reading. Academics might shy away from a gathering hosted by the latest celebrity gossip. Even in the most non-threatening kind of home gatherings, we tend to gravitate towards those that we have things in common with. Those who choose to attend events and functions believe they will enjoy them, and they still hate to be out of place. And yet we all have, most likely at one time or another, walked through the door and been hit by the feeling... I don't belong here. These are not my people. Have you ever had that? You've walked in and already before anything's happened, you feel uncomfortable. Well, Peter in the scripture passage we're addressing today is dealing with this issue, I think, in the life of the Christian and trying to help us understand a difficulty that we have at times trying to reconcile being in the world, but not of the world. One commentator in his commentary on 1 Peter writes, in the first sentence of this letter, go back to chapter 1, verse 1, Peter told his church that they were strangers or exiles, aliens, sojourners, because Jesus redeemed us from a futile life, and we looked at that in chapter 1, verse 18, and he gave us instead a new life. By repentance and faith, we become God's people, his prized possession, and by the same act, he writes, we necessarily become and ought to remain partly estranged from this age. So that helps us understand our inability to fit in or to be at home in this world. It's part of our new DNA of knowing the Lord as our Savior. We'll see that fulfill itself a little further in our message this morning. But in part, the separation that's occurred in the life of every Christian, every true Christ follower, means that we have accepted the chief cornerstone as our cornerstone for living, Jesus Christ. 
to the Jewish people in particular, people, <clears throat> Peter, some of the people that Peter was writing to, they had the chance to accept Christ. They examined him even, it says in chapter 2, verse 4, but they chose to reject him. The Jewish people in particular, we read in the scriptures, chose to not see Jesus as their Messiah, but as a mere man being punished by God for his own sins. Isaiah chapter 53, verses 3 and 4 says, He was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief, and as one from whom men hide their faces, he was despised and we esteemed him not. New Living Translation says, and we didn't care. Verse 4, surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him stricken by God, stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. And again, another translation says, and we thought his troubles were a punishment from God, a punishment for his own sins. Being able to examine who Jesus was, to read his words, to hear his message, and still turn away from him is the result of a darkened heart. It's a result of a mindset of this world and not a spiritual one. To the people of Jesus' time and even today, the Jewish nation refuses to see Jesus as the Messiah. And of course, many people around the world still reject him as the Savior of the world. Jesus didn't fit in to many people's estimation of what he should have been. He still doesn't fit in to many people's estimation of what a Messiah and a Savior should be. He doesn't live up to their expectations of a victorious, conquering Savior. And so to the Jews, as Pastor Daniel showed us last week in that passage just above, he became a stumbling block or a stumbling stone, a rock of offense. And in the New Testament and the Gospels in particular, we need to be reminded that there is a great cost that comes to following Christ as our Savior, to be a Christ follower. Luke chapter 9, verses 23 through 26, Jesus lays out the sacrifice that he's expecting for those who would be willing to examine him and then accept him for who he says he is. And Jesus said to them all, If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross daily, and follow me. For whoever would save his life would lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will, f will save it. For what does it profit a man if he gain the whole world and lose his own soul? And then verse 26, sometimes we stop at verse 25 because we think, well, that's pretty powerful. You lose your own soul by, re by rejecting Christ. Be but he reminds us then, if you've got a different pursuit other than Jesus Christ, you're pursuing things of the world, well, whoever is ashamed of me and my words, of him will the Son of Man be ashamed when he comes in his glory and the glory of the Father and of the holy angels. There's a high cost involved in examining Christ and then accepting Christ for who he is. And we shouldn't leave that aside when we're trying to find our way in this world. The reason we don't sometimes feel like we fit in is because we don't fit in. We don't and shouldn't feel at home in this world. And there are many other passages like that in the epistles emphasizing the high cost of discipleship, the, the, the cost of following one who is not of this world. Peter writes and focuses in in chapter 2, verses 4 through 12, of the wonder, wonderful spiritual privileges that are provided to those who believe in him and who are willing to embrace the cost of being a Christ follower. So if you, like I at times this morning or other days, feel that you don't fit in, that's okay. Let's understand why we don't fit in. Peter says, let me share with you some of the reasons you feel like you don't fit in or that you cannot even feel at home in this world. First of all, in, chapter, in verse 9, Peter reminds us that there's a real difference between Christians and those who are unsaved. And although, unfortunately, the appearance or the, the distinctions do not always appear on the outside as they should in terms of our lifestyles, they are real and emphatic. So Peter begins, let's understand what it is to be a follower of Christ. First of all, he says in verse 9, we are a chosen race. We're spiritual people elect by God himself. It's, Peter's quoting here from Deuteronomy chapter 7, verses 6 through 9. And, and Moses is saying to the nation of Israel, For you are a people holy to the Lord your God. The Lord your God has chosen you to be a people for his treasured possession out of all the peoples that are on the face of the earth. And Peter identifies the New Testament believer, those who believe in Jesus Christ, also as chosen in a similar fashion. 
We are not Israel. Israel is not us. But Peter's using the example of Israel this morning to say, as God chose the nation of Israel, so he has chosen a new group of people called the church to represent him in this world today. We have a unity then that comes through us through our common heritage. We have a unity that comes through our common new birth. We have the same father as we looked at last week. We have the same laws and customs and standards by which we need to follow. And that brings us unity as a chosen race. It's God's choice that overrides anything that we might try to put together as a common uh, as a commonality, some people gather together because they have the same heritage, they're from the same country, they have a similar language, but ours goes deeper. It's a spiritual unity that Christ has given to us as a result of our faith in him. And God alone is responsible for this election. It's not something that we ran for and won an election or an office. It's something that God has given to us. And so this is something unique for the Christian that God has elected or selected us to be his children. And we're in this together, those of us who know Christ as our Savior, we're in this together all the way. So if you look around this room and you see people that you know are believers and that you're a believer yourself, you know what? We're in this together forever. So get your act together, would you? Secondly, we are, to, we are a royal priesthood. Peter says he refers again to an important event in the history of the nation of Israel in Exodus chapter 19. And the experiences that Israel had at Mount Sinai are, are very much a part of what made them a covenant people and turned them into a nation, his chosen people. Now God spoke to Israel again in Exodus 19 verses 5 and 6. And it says, now therefore, Moses says, if you will indeed obey my voice, or God speaking through Moses, if you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, you shall be my treasured possession among all peoples, for all the earth is mine. And you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. So God conveys to the nation of Israel through Moses that they are something unique, that no other nation, no other people, no other group has been called to be a kingdom of priests. With the emphasis on the royal priesthood, the emphasis here is not on a place or, or a gathering, but on the people themselves. You and I are royal priests, Peter says. We represent God. We have access into his presence, Hebrews chapter 4, verses 14 through 16. Not everybody has access to the presence of the king of kings. Does that amaze you? It should be an amazing truth that, that causes within us a desire to pray more, to read the scriptures more, to get to know him more. Not everyone has that privilege. Peter says, you do. And not only do you have access and privilege to be in his presence, but he has chosen you to represent him to the world. That's what priests do. Uh, Deuteronomy chapter 10, verse 8. At that time, the Lord set apart the tribe of Levi, the priests of Israel, to carry the Ark of the Covenant, covenant and to stand before the Lord as his ministers. This church has two pastors. But I believe if everyone were here, we'd have about 150 ministers. Understand what I'm saying? Everybody has been called to stand before the Lord and to serve him, to represent him to take the blessings that he gives to us and share those with others. That's what Deuteronomy 10, 8 says. And to stand before the Lord and to pronounce blessings in his name. And Moses goes on to say, these are their duties to this day. God didn't change his mind. He said, well, I'm going to try this out and see how it works. I'm going to get a group of people together and I'm going to share my blessings with them. I'm going to allow them into my presence and we'll see what they do with it. You know, whether this works, it's, that's not his plan. His plan is that it will work. He wants it to work. He's designed it to work. The only problem is he's called people. And sometimes we're not willing to do what God has asked us to do. But he says, I've called you to be a royal priesthood. God's clear intentions was, again, that the priests were to stand before the Lord and then go out from his presence changed and charged up, I wrote in my notes, to share these blessings with others. And that's what Jesus or Peter is telling us as disciples of Jesus Christ today we are to do. Royal priests who serve the king, the king's priesthood. 
Well, it's because of our salvation, again, that unites us with Jesus Christ. We become royal priests, as he is a royal king. And so we are called to be holy as well. Pastor Daniel addressed that, so I'll not spend time on that in the passage just before that. But it means that every Christian, as one author said, is the ultimate insider. You know how they talk about being an insider on the stock market and with the, the ups and downs of the Dow and so on. Well, in terms of what God is doing, we are insiders. In terms of having access to his presence, we are insiders. We have an opportunity that others do not have. And Peter says, you may feel like exiles, you may feel like sojourners, you may feel like aliens, but you are an insider with God. Consider it a privilege and an honor to represent him. It's an encouraging word to those who may have felt, even from the first chapter, that they are alone in the world. That they don't fit in anywhere, that they have no place with which they can feel comfortable. Peter says, nonsense, recognize who God has called you to be and who you are in his eyes. We have the privilege to be in his presence and the responsibility to represent him to the world. And Peter, in that same passage in Exodus chapter 19, says, thirdly, we are a holy nation. He recognizes the responsibility that that people had individually to be representatives before him, but as a nation, as a group, as a church, we are responsible as well to represent Jesus Christ. The church, although the word is not used, people, we understand that Peter is referring to that. Uh, He uses the word uh, that one of our, uh, two of our missionaries uh, are supported by an organization called Ethnos. And the word literally means a community of people held together by the same laws, customs, and mutual interests. Well, that's the church, right? A community of people held together by the same laws, customs, and mutual interests. The law of God, the principles and and dictates that God has given given to us in his word hold us together. And the term that when it was used of Israel was that they were united by their covenantal relationship to him, making them God's people or the people of God. And and Peter says that's what the church is. That's what you and I are. There's no nation that is a godly nation because Israel was the only unique nation of God, his people. But we are, as the church, uh, a unique international nation crossing all kinds of borders. COVID can't stop this sort of stuff. Isn't that wonderful? There's some things that COVID can't slow down, and it's the truth of God's word, and it's the truth of the church, that we cross international borders. We have a common spiritual life from God all around the world because we're committed to his laws, his word, that doesn't change, and committed to the same common savior. Peter wants to remind us, though, that sometimes you don't fit in, sometimes you feel alone in the world, sometimes you don't have a place, but you do in the body of Christ. We should be able to go anywhere in the world and worship with people of like-minded faith and feel what? At home. Israel, the the tragedy that Israel's, of of Israel's rejection of Christ turned out to be a blessing for the Gentiles. We went through that in our Bible study on Tuesday mornings, Romans 9 through 11. And it turned out to be a blessing for us. Israel will, of course, one day again be called God's holy people when the nation turns and repents and receive Christ as their savior but in the meantime we are to be holy representatives of God and united in our commonalities as we live in Christ well fourthly Peter says you are a people for God's own possession and again Exodus chapter 19 verse 5 God says if you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant then you shall be my own possession from among all peoples There's a wonderful truth, again, that Peter is trying to get across to us, that although the world may not recognize us as their own and we don't fit in, that's okay because God does recognize us. God does remember us. God knows the place where he has put us, and God is with us there in that place. We are his own possession. It's not just an issue of, of, of ownership. We know 1 Corinthians, Paul says in chapter 6, verses 19 and 20, that we've been bought with a price we're not our own therefore we're to glorify God but involved in the understanding of this I believe is that God desires to begin in our lives a vital relationship with us he's not a distant God that we create with our own hands out of wood and iron and trees and rocks and so on he's a living God who desires to communicate and build a loving and living relationship with us 
The word that's used, or Isaiah 43, verse 1 says, Fear not, for I have redeemed you. I have called you by name. You are mine. I love that verse. It's like when somebody says, you know, you take John 3, 16, and you say, For God so loved Dan. You put your own name in there. And to the nation of Israel, God said, You know, I have called you Judas. I have called you uh, Peter. I have called you uh, what are some other good Jewish names? Uh, Eli. <laughs> I, I've called you Sarah. Individually, God says, I've called you by name. You are mine. He says that to us this morning. Titus chapter 2, verse 14. He gave himself for us to redeem us from all, from all lawlessness and to purify for himself a people for his own possession who are zealous for good works. Well, you're a, we are a chosen race, we are a royal priesthood, we are a holy nation, we are a people for God's own possession, and we have been called out of darkness into his marvelous light. This is an amazing truth. Amazing truth. Jesus himself said, this is the judgment, that the light has come into the world, and men love darkness rather than light, for their deeds are evil. For everyone who does evil hates the light and does not come to the light for fear that his deeds may be exposed. And that's how the Lord says we used to live. We love doing things for ourselves. That's the old nature. We love doing things that were even bad if we could get away with them. Don't you remember your own childhood? No one? No one ever stole a cookie? Am I the only one? No, you did things because if you could get away with it, it was a, it was a thrill. It was, there was excitement. If you could lie and get away with it, if you could steal and get away with it, if you could think bad thoughts and no one would know, you enjoyed that sort of thing. Men love darkness rather than light. But Jesus says, I've called you out of that kind of lifestyle, that kind of mindset, that kind of living, and I've called you into something so much better. It's, part of, it's, it's not the fact, <clears> or <throat> he's called us, excuse me, out of darkness, and the spiritually dark place that we used to live in was the absolute dark condition of a lost soul. Without God, without hope, without focus, without a future, in a similarly dark and lost world. That's our condition. Dead in our trespasses and sins, Paul says. But God has not just called us out of darkness with no place to go. He has called us out of darkness into his light. And not just his light, but his marvelous light. This darkness is part of the old that has passed away, 2 Corinthians 5.17. And the light is the new which has come. In this light we have new minds, we have new hearts, we have new understanding, we have new discernment, we have new enlightenment to know the truth, to do the truth, a new desire to serve the King of Kings and our Savior that we never had before. Because if the Son will set you free, you shall be free indeed. If the truth shall set you free, you shall be free indeed. Freedom is not just to do anything we want, but God's given us that desire and that motivation to do what will make us more like him. And it's not just a move from a dark place to a light place, like moving from one room to another. I, I, I don't know whether this is even a, a right English uh, conglomeration put together. Sometimes I struggle, you know, with the English things like that. But this is a spiritually transformational move. Is that a good sentence? spiritually transformational move that God has put us into the sphere in which he himself dwells. That's kind of cool. We're outside of God's light until we receive Christ as our Savior. And then it's as if we step into the light. Have you ever watched something on the TV where the guy's outside of the spotlight and then he steps into the spotlight? And things are clear. He can find things. He can see things. But he steps out into the darkness he can't, and that's unsaved to being saved. It's a whole new world. Into this place and sphere of being, Christians have been brought by their faith in Jesus Christ. It's the sphere in which we live and move and have our being. Paul said that in Acts 17, 24 in Athens. In him we live and move and have our being. And I've pictured it before as walking around in a kind of a little bubble. And I don't know how else to explain it, but wherever I go, who goes with me? The Lord goes with me. There's no place where I can move right now that will be out of the sphere of his existence, out of the realm of me living in Christ, living in the light. 
If I choose to close my eyes, that's my choice, but I don't have to because he desires to give me that desire to serve him, to know him, to study his word. And it's a marvelous transformation, a deep and transforming change. It's full of wonder and amazement. Paul says, oh, the depth of the riches and the wisdom and the discernment of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and how inscrutable his ways. As well as coming out of the darkness, Peter in this section uses a whole bunch of Old Testament quotes. And I want to just be brief on this note. But how in the world are all these new believers supposed to know the Old Testament scriptures? How are they supposed to, in their young existence, know the word of God? People's, Peter's using some quotes that are pretty radical in terms of the, or, or uh, hard to find, I should say, in, in terms of their understanding. I, I, I assume that the new believers in the New Testament really wanted to know the word of God. They really wanted to study it. They wanted to find out what the difference was in their life. What has God done in my life? How can I get to know my Savior? How can I get to understand what he wants me to do? And they search the scriptures daily. If Peter and the people of his day made such an effort to get to know the word of God, as Peter said in chapter 2, verses 1 and 2, just look back there. As newborn babes desire the sincere miracle of the word, what should we do? We should also desire it. Can we make the connection that to gain this new knowledge of the book, the Bible, uh, as much as they had at this point, they had to, to hold on to it, they had to learn it, they had to sacrifice and spend time with it. And the challenge this morning, I think, is how much effort are we making each week, each day, each month to gain a sense of the scriptures? You know, I, I've read a, a book recently, and it's called The Insanity of God, and it's not that the author is saying God is insane. Although sometimes we don't understand his methods and his ways. But he's trying to get to the point that God does some things sometimes that we don't understand. That we don't really appreciate. And maybe that's an understatement, right? Let me read very quickly just one short section. How many of us who strive to follow Jesus today have ever wished we could have witnessed firsthand the kind of spiritual adventures and the life-changing resurrection-powered faith experienced by believers in the New Testament? And he says, I believe we can. And we don't need a time machine to do it. We need only to look and listen to our brothers who are faithfully living for, for Christ today in our world's toughest place. When his wife and himself first departed from Africa with our boys almost 30 years ago, I was a naive Kentucky farm boy who believed that God was sending us around the world on a great adventure to tell people who Jesus was and to explain the gospel and the Bible, what it was all about. Today, I realize that God allowed us to go into the world so we could find out who Jesus was from the people who really knew him and actually lived the word of God. I have learned so much more than I have been taught. I know now that when Ruth and I, his wife, began this pilgrimage into the persecution 15 years ago, we were asking the wrong questions and seeking the wrong sort of answers. What we discovered through God's grace and with the help of hundreds of faithful people wasn't so much of a strategy or a method or a plan. Rather, it was a person. We found you, Jesus, and we found that Jesus is very much alive and well in the 21st century. Jesus is revealed in the lives and words and resurrection faith of believers in persecution. These believers don't just live for Jesus, they live with Jesus every day. And then finally... These believers have also taught me a whole new perspective on persecution. For decades now, many concerned Western believers have sought to rescue their spiritual brothers and sisters around the world who suffer because they choose to follow Jesus. Yet our pilgrimage among these house churches in persecution convinced us that God may actually want to use them to save us from the often debilitating and sometimes spiritually fatal, fatal efforts of our watered-down, powerless Western faith. It's a pretty powerful book. It's a pretty powerful truth. And it seems like, in many ways, per persecution like that, and, and what some of these people have gone through is a long way off from us, but I don't think so. I think we need to open our eyes and see what's happening around our world today, and I think we need to be alert to what God is doing. We need to be like the men of Issachar who are noted in I think it's First Chronicles 16, 20, that they, they knew the times for Israel and what to do. And Peter says, I have given you, I have pulled you out of darkness into my marvelous light. So we need to see our, ask ourselves, what is God trying to 
teach us today? What is he wanting us to see and to learn and to know so that we might be better prepared for the future? Because, Peter says sixthly and finally, we have been saved to proclaim the excellencies of the Lord. You know, all those privileges that we've had, I mean, think, we're chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for God's own possession, called out of darkness into his marvelous light, wonderful. And too many Christians stop there and think, I am so glad I'm me. And that I have this wonderful relationship with the Lord. He says, whoa, 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 keep going. He's called us and given us and privileged us with all of those things so that we might declare the praises of his marvelous glory. Peter reminds us that the lofty titles bestowed upon us in Christ are not merely for our own personal gratification or for our corporate glory as much as they are for the service of God. God's purpose in saving us is to reveal himself to others through us. Save for the purpose of proclaiming the excellencies of the Lord, the praises of him who has saved us. And there's much more to say on that, but we're, we're running out of time. But it's clear, it's a clear reminder to us all as Peter wraps this, these couple of verses up that we have been saved for a purpose. It's a clear reminder to us of the church's evangelistic purposes to tell others about what is happening within. And I would say if there's one, I wrote my notes here, if there's one particular function of our church, Faith Fellowship Baptist Church, that needs some work, it's our ability and our task as a church to tell others in our community about Jesus Christ. We just simply need to get better at it, individually and corporately. And it's not the responsibility just of Pastor Dan and I, but of all of us together to share the word. Sometimes, you know, it's easier as a pastor to share the scripture. Do you believe that? Because people expect us to do that. That's our job. We get paid to be evangelistic. But sometimes, you know, it can be a real hindrance because people say, you're just paid to do this. It's just your job. But no matter how it looks, Peter tells us in 1 Peter 3.15 that all of us need to be prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks us for the reason for the hope that is within us, with gentleness and fear. What would happen this week, as I mentioned earlier in our Thanksgiving time, if we just said thank you and God bless you, and, and just open our mouth just a little bit. Try it this week and see what happens. See what kind of results and responses you get from people. Their eyes might open a little bit more. They might even respond by saying, thank you, you're the first person this week that's even acknowledged my existence. Just look for little ways that we can say thank you to our Lord for all the blessings that he's given to us, given to us so that we might express to someone else the excellencies of his wonder and grace. Because once, verse 10 says, we were not a people, but now we're God's people. That song that we sang earlier should remind us of the thankfulness that we should have in our hearts. One of God's excellencies in particular that I want you to think about this week in closing is that God is merciful. God is merciful. Do you believe that? He hath not dealt with us after our sins, nor rewarded us according to our, his, according to our iniquities. But as high as the heaven is above the earth, so great is his steadfast love towards those who fear him. So far as the east from the west, so far as he removed our transgressions from us. And the verses that precede that, verse 8 says, the, why? Why did he do all that? Because the Lord is gracious and merciful. <clears throat> In the moment of our salvation, God demonstrated his mercy as he rescued us from hellfire and damnation of eternal punishment because we were lost in sin. And instead, because we were willing to evaluate the Savior, his Son, and willing to accept him as our Savior, he transferred us from the darkness into the light. We can't go back. That's another mercy of God. Because how many times do you and I fail him? No, wait, let me rephrase that. How many times already today have you failed to do what he's asked us to do? Maybe we've had already had a wrong attitude. We've neglected to do something that we know we should have done. We, the Lord's merciful and gracious, translated us out of darkness into his marvelous light. 
And may these truths encourage us all today and challenge us in our faithful living that our true identity is to be found not in this world, in the things that we do here that will eventually perish and pass away forever, but in Christ. We do not fit into this world, so please stop trying. We'll never feel fully at home in this world, so recognize the reality of that and put more emphasis on preparing yourself for your eternal home. For only in Christ can we find our place. Now, what will you do with Jesus? There may be someone here or someone watching this morning. It says that when Jesus stood outside of Jerusalem and recognized the city that he had come to save was going to reject him, he wept. And I would pray that you would make a different decision this morning, that you would be willing to come to Jesus Christ as your Savior, to come out of the darkness of unbelief and by faith step into his marvelous light. And I would pray, too, for the saved, that we would as well continue to walk in the light as he is in the light, and that we would step out of the darkness sometimes of our unwillingness to obey him into the light of obedience and watch how God will bless. Let's pray. Dear Lord, as we come to you this morning, though the world may reject us, we know that you have accepted us in Jesus Christ. May we receive your rule in our life with humble thanksgiving. We know that it will never be a place where we can fit in here to be at home in the world. You have given us or you have chosen us to be a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people of your own possession. You have called us out of darkness into your marvelous light. So may we from this day forward, especially today, honor you by recognizing the calling and the salvation that is ours. Help us, Father, to be like our Savior, Jesus Christ. For we pray it in his name. Amen.